Hello everyone, hope studying for the final is going okay for you so far and that you're just here to check some answers that are already right, but if you are having any trouble, hopefully these explanations will get you back on track. Let's go ahead and jump in and start looking at number one together. According to the M&M website, May 2007, the color distribution for their candy varies depending on the type of M&M you buy. So there's the traditional milk chocolate, but then there's also peanut and peanut butter, my favorite, and some other brands or types as well. So the color distribution claimed by the website for milk chocolate M&Ms is shown in the chart below. A statistics student scooped 117 M&Ms out of a large bag of milk chocolate M&Ms, and the counts for the student sample are shown below. All right, so we've got the different colors, we got the percentages claimed by the website, and then we got the counts from the student sample. And they want us to answer the question, does the data provide enough evidence at the 10% significance level to show that the true distribution of colors of all the candy in the bag is not as claimed by the website? So we're treating this bag as our population and this scoop as our random sample. And they're talking about significance levels and evidence. So that sounds like a hypothesis test. The first thing we have to decide is which type. If we get the type wrong, we're usually in big trouble on one of these. So we're looking for some keywords. Uh, true distribution is catching my attention on this one. When they talk about um, seeing if we have a certain type of distribution, that usually is wording we see in a goodness of fit test. But I don't want to rely too much on just those words, so I want to think about what is a goodness of fit test. It's a hypothesis test to see if the distribution matches a certain model, and what we're looking at is percentages for multiple categories. Well, here we have six categories and we have claim percentages so it does look like we're trying to see if that percentage model works we got multiple categories that does indeed sound like a goodness of fit test so we're going to jump in there and do the six steps of that the first step is to write down the null and alternative hypothesis so that will be step one to come up with ho and h1 and one of the things you want to remember for these is that is done in words and a lot of times you're going to get one of those sentences right in the question. So what do they want us to show? That the true distribution of colors of all the candy in the bag is not as claimed in the website. So that right there is either H0 or H1. It says not as claimed, which has a does not equal sort of sound to it. So that should be H1 because HO has to have an equality word word. So let's just write that one down though because we can copy it word for word. So just copying that part I've kind of highlighted there. So missed a word. The true distribution of colors of all the candy in the bag is not as claimed by the website. All right, so there is H1. HO is almost the same, except for it will say is, claim, is as claimed by the website to have that equal to feel. Since it's almost the same, I don't mind you doing just kind of a dot, dot, dot on it. Because I kind of messed up there, I'm gonna start off by writing the true distribution. And then dot, dot, dot for all this part, and then is as claimed. And dot 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 for the by the website. I don't mind if you do this dot 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 thing on one of the two hypotheses. You cannot do it on both of them. I need to see one of them written out fully on the final exam. So there's step one, hypothesis H0, H1, both written in words. Step two is to decide on a significance level, but that's already been decided, so we're just going to make a note of it. Alpha is 0.10. And now for the goodness of fit test, we want to do our test statistic which is a chi-squared test statistic, and that is the sum of the values of O minus E squared over E. So we've got to make a table to figure that out. A little tight on space right here, so what I'm going to try and do to help with that is I'm going to use this table right here as a head start. So this column right here would represent the values of O, so I'll go ahead and just label that up top as O. 
And then these are almost the value of P. Uh, the values of P, or PI, as we often put them, would be the decimal version of that. I don't know if I can squeeze them in as tight as the font, so I'm going to give myself a little extra height here. So the 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.13, 0 0.24, 0 0.20, and 0 0.16. Maybe I needed a little bit more room, but kind of squeezed it in there. So there's O, there's PI. And now what we want next is the expected frequencies. So I'm going to add another column here for expected frequency. Remember, expected frequencies are n times p or n times pi. And the other part is, what are we supposed to use for p? Well, I've kind of already labeled it, but why those? Because we're supposed to use the percentages that would apply if HO is true. HO says the true distribution is as claimed by the website, and these are the claimed percentages by the website. So I'm just converting them to decimal, and now I'm just going to do the multiplication. So we're just going in here one by one, multiplying those by 0.13. Let me see if I can show you some tricks to speed this up a little bit. So I'm going to go into stat and edit, and in L1 I'm going to put the values of O, so 26, 13, 21, 11, 21, and 25. Then I'm going to put these values of PI into L2, and then I'm going to multiply all of those by the value of N, which is the number of M&Ms. I believe it said 117. Yeah, there it is right there. So I'm going to have L3 be all the values in L2 multiplied by 117. So 117 times all the numbers in L2. So I'm taking that and I'm multiplying each of those individually, but it's gonna happen all at once. And those are our expected frequencies. So write those down. 15.21, 16.38, and so on. So let me get those in the table. Be nice to see the totals on those as well. The totals on your expected frequencies should match up with the total from O. Uh, let me just do that as scratch work over here. Let's go into the list menu above stat, list, math. I want the sum of list three. So I'm finding the sum of L3. This is kind of an optional step, but notice we get that 117 back to kind of verify that we have those right. And then we want our mini z-scores over here in the last column. So those would be the values of O minus E squared over E. And I'm going to do all of those at once, too, because I have my O's in L1, and I have the values of E in L3. So I can use L1 minus L3 squared divided by L3 to calculate all the mini z's at once. And I'll do that for L4. So I'm going to clear out that number, put parentheses. Where are my values of O? L1. So second L1 minus where are the values of E, L3. And then I need that squared and divided by the values of E, which are in L3. So if I do that, I'm getting all the mini z-scores at once. Remember, a z-score that is a mini z-score that is over 2 is a sign that you saw an unusually big difference in that category. So for that first color, can't see what it is because of the calculator, we observed 26, but we only expected 15 of that color, so we got kind of a lot of that color, and that is standing out as an unusually big difference. Kind of hard to believe that difference is just due to random variation. So just based on that category alone, I'm leaning towards rejecting HO. The next color, things came out pretty close to what was expected, so that is a difference small enough between, what, 13 and 16.38 that random variation is a reasonable explanation for that one. The next one, 2.204 over 2, so kind of big evidence. Oh my goodness, look at the fourth one, 10.389. They're saying we got a huge difference between O and E there. So what was O? 11. We expected 11 of that color, but we got 28. So that is a huge difference. So now I'm leaning kind of massively towards rejecting HO. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the way this is going to turn out, even though the next color doesn't provide much evidence of a difference, but the last one a bit. I wrote all these to three decimal places because I'm thinking of them as many z-scores, and so with z-scores we always do three decimals, so I did the same thing here. 
So then our test statistic isn't any one of those. Come back and look over here again. Our test statistic is the sum of all those. So what I want to do now is just slide over one column, go into that list menu again, so second list, go over to math. I want to find the sum of that column I just computed. So the sum of the data in L4 is, let's highlight it so we can see more decimals, 23.298. So there's our test statistic. So worth a quick mention, when I add that up on the calculator, I'm adding the unrounded version of these. If I go over there, there's lots of decimal places on those. So over here, I wrote them to just three, and if you add those up with those three, you might get a different last decimal. And I would take either version, adding the rounded or adding the unrounded. This is actually the more accurate version right here. All right, so we've got three steps done. And based on some of the really big mini z-scores, we're leaning towards rejecting HO but let's confirm that with our p-value. So this is a chi-squared test statistic, so we want to calculate our p-value on a chi-squared curve. Remember that doesn't go from negative infinity to infinity, but rather starts at zero and goes to the right. And the peak, if you drop down from there and move just a little bit to the right, that would be the df, and the df is one less than the number of categories you had. So we had six color categories right here. So one less than that would be a DF of five. So we got a chi-squared distribution with a DF of five. And this is zero right here. So where's our test statistic of 23.298? Five, 10, 15, 20, 23 is maybe off here. And notice you can't see my pen anymore because it's way over there to the right off of the page. I do want to see it, so I'll just put it over here at the far end. But we should think about the fact of, like, where is it really? It's, it's way out there. So when I think about uh, shading the area, and remember all chi-squared tests that we do are right-tailed, uh, certainly the goodness of fit is. So if I shade the area to the right, and you think about how big that is, you have to realize this is actually even further to the right where the graph is getting flatter, so the area is even smaller than it looks. But it certainly looks small. And... I think it makes sense that it looks small because we said we're leaning towards rejecting, which requires a low p-value. It's always good to think about are the pieces fitting together. So to get our p-value, we want to do chi-squared CDF of our test statistic, 23.298 to infinity with 5 degrees of freedom. That'll be equal to whatever our p-value is. So let's put that into the calculator and get our p-value. So I'm going to second quit to get out of the table area. Go into the distribution menu, chi-squared CDF, kind of way down there, 23.298 to infinity. Make sure you have infinity stored in I. If you don't, just use a big number like 1,000, and then comma 5 degrees of freedom. The E negative 4 tells me I need to move my decimal four spots to the left or that that 2 is in the fourth decimal spot. So my p-value would be 0 .000, and then the fourth decimal spot would be that 2. But that's the last spot I'm going to write, and it's followed by a 9. So I'm going to put a 3 right there. Very key number in our hypothesis test. There it is, our p-value. If HO was true, there only would have been a 0 .0003 chance of seeing a test statistic as far to the right as we did. So it's pretty unlikely that if HO is true, we would have got a test statistic like this, and yet we did get this test stat. So I take that p-value to make me think it's kind of hard to believe that HO is true. So hard to believe, in fact, that I'm willing to reject HO. Because the p-value tells me there is a low and therefore acceptable risk of making a type 1 error. So most of it's done, now we just need to write out our conclusion in words. So we were able to reject HO because there was enough evidence at the 10% significance level. Our p-value was really small, so we could have rejected also at the 5% or 1% significant levels as well. So we were kind of made it by a long margin with the 10% cutoff. So there was enough evidence at the 10% significance level basically to show H1, so to show that, and then we're gonna write the rest of that down.
All right, so we basically decided that as far as our you know big Costco bag of M&Ms went, uh, which we took this scoop from, even though we only looked at a scoop, we're convinced that the color mixture in this bag does not match up with what the company has claimed on their website. And you know, why is that? It could be variation from bag to bag. We could have got an unlucky bag. It could be that this is old information, May 2007. Maybe they've decided to color or change their color mix. Who knows? But we are convinced that this bag is not following the mixture claimed by the website, even though we only looked at a scoop of a very large bag. All right, let's take a look at the last piece. In terms of this application and evidence, explain what it would have meant for us to make a type 1 error. So I think we should start out with the definition of a type 1 error, which is rejecting HO when it is in fact true. So how do you reject HO? Uh, you have to have had enough evidence. And then what would make it a type 1 error? Only if the evidence was contrary tr to the truth. So let me try and say it, and then we'll write it. So it would be a type 1 error if there was enough evidence to show that the color mixture was not as claimed by the website when in fact the color mixture really was the same as claimed by the website. So we're getting the reject part by saying we had enough evidence to show they, it was different. We're getting the error part by saying the truth of the matter is contrary to what our evidence showed. So let me write that out. So if we had enough evidence to show that the true distribution of colors in the bag is not the same as claimed by the website, That's roughly just copying this again. So that's just the we rejected part. Now we need that that was an error. So this conclusion would be an error when in fact the distribution really is as claimed. All right, so I'm taking a look at my video timer here, and I'm seeing we spent quite a bit of time on this problem. Hypothesis tests do take a while. Granted, it slows down a little when I'm explaining the process rather than just doing it, but they are time consuming, and you do not want to spend all this time on a problem and be completely off track. So the very first thing we did was kind of the most important part that we analyzed the wording, and we thought about what kind of hypothesis test it was, and we jumped in there and started doing the process then. Uh, make sure that you feel real confident about the type. If you don't, you should probably go on to another problem for now. And when you come back to one, if you're trying to do a hypothesis test and none of the pieces that you're looking for are easily or readily available, a lot of times that means you've chosen the wrong type. So as you're studying, as you're doing review exercises and working through this worksheet, make sure you're putting a lot of emphasis on the keywords that direct you down the right path. All right, moving on to the next problem. In 1912, the RMS Titanic, a British passenger ship, sank in the North Atlantic Ocean after colliding with an iceberg. Historians do not know the exact passenger list, so the death toll is estimated. Here's the data from those estimates of the 2,201 passengers on board by their cabin class, and also by whether they died or they survived. So. We're going to take the perhaps unwise step of considering this as a random sample of what would have happened with any large passenger ship at that time. I don't know if the Titanic is representative of that. We could also maybe think of this as the Titanic hit an iceberg at a certain day at a certain time and this is the way it turned out. But what if it had happened a half hour earlier, a day sooner, uh, a different time, right? Maybe this could be thought of as a random sample of one of those possible ways the Titanic could have sank. So it's not our traditional random sample, but we'll go ahead and proceed and try and look at the question. Does the data provide enough evidence at the 1% significance level to show that the death survive outcome for passengers was dependent on the type of passenger that we were looking at? So 
looks like a hypothesis test. We're talking about significance levels. We're talking about is there enough evidence. So that is the language of a hypothesis test. But just like we mentioned in the last problem, we don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on a hypothesis test and be doing the wrong type of math for it. So what type is it? Well, we're trying to determine was one variable dependent on another one. And so the, the different language of that would be independent on. That's the other option. So this seems like a test of independence, given that we have dependent as something we're trying to show. The other hypothesis would be independent. Just double checking that to not rely too much on just a word. What do tests of independence look like? They tend to have two-way tables with a variable down the side and across the top. And then we're checking for independence, dependence of those. So it seems to fit that model as well. So we're going to proceed with the six steps of a chi-squared test of independence. Step one is to write down the null and alternative hypotheses. So we want H0 and H1 for tests of independence. That does get written out in words. And as is typical, we can find the wording for one of them if we just look at the question. So to show that, what are we trying to show? The death survive outcome for passengers is dependent on the passenger type. On tests of independence, because of the way formulas work for independence, um, when things are independent, the formulas are equal. When the things we're checking for independence are not equal, that's when we have dependence. So there is a sense in which independent goes with equality and dependent goes with not equals. So we would want equals in HO, so that's where the independence goes based on our probability formulas. H1 will be the one that has dependent. Since that one's written out, I'm going to write it for H1, just copying that down. So the death survive outcome. For passengers was dependent on the type of the passenger. And I suppose there's different things that we could mean by the type of the passenger in this problem, we're talking about what type of class their ticket was, first class, second class, third class, or crew, with first class generally being the most expensive, just like airline flights today, and third class being the cheapest, the kind of coach, the economy ticket. All right, so the other one would have been the same, except for it would have said independent of. So same sentence with those two words swapped out. And as I've mentioned before, I don't mind if you do the kind of dot, dot, dot on one of them, but you have to write one of them out completely. All right, step two is to decide on the significance level, but it's already decided. We just need to write it down and generally switching that from the percentage to the decimal form. So I'll write alpha equals 0.01. And then we want to move on to the chi-squared test statistic. And it's the same as on a goodness of fit test in the sense that it is the sum of O minus E squared over E, or mini Z scores. So I want to calculate a mini Z score for every cell that cross classifies these variables. So not the totals, but all the other ones. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. So I need to come up with eight mini Z scores, which will make up my chi-squared test statistic. These are the O's that are already in the table. So what I need are the expected frequencies. I'm just going to calculate a couple of them, and then I have the rest written down. So for speed, I'll fill those in. But the formula for getting an expected frequency is to take the row total for that cell. So we're going to do this cell right here. So we want the row total for that one, 1490 times the column total for that cell. So go across and down from there and divide by the grand total. So we observed 122 first class passengers that died. If these things were independent, we would have expected 1490 times 325 divided by 2201. So we would have expected about 220.01 passengers that were first class to have died if they were independent. Remember, when we talk about the frequency we expect, that's the free frequency we would expect if HO was true. Sorry, that number right there is a little messy. That is a zero. Let's do the next one. 
So I'll switch colors here just so we can kind of track that. So I'm going to work on this green one. Uh, in fact, let's let's jump over here. Let's just do kind of a, a random one in a different spot over here. So if we're doing this one, we would want to look across to the 711 down to the 706. It's always row total times column total divided by grand total. So sticking with that square right there, row total 711 times column total 706 divided by grand total 2201. So we had 178 passengers in the third class and what was that? Uh, survived category. But if these things were independent, we would have expected about 228.06. Remember, we usually write expected frequencies in parentheses to distinguish them from the observed. But also expected frequencies can be decimals, observed can't. So the whole numbers are your observed and the decimal ones are going to be your expected. All right, so I'm going to fill in the rest. It's just the same pattern. 1490 times 285 over 2201 gives 192.94. There's no real trick to speed this up. I just did them earlier so I could make the video a little bit shorter. So I'm just filling those in from that one I cooked up earlier. All right, so now we have eight observed frequencies and we have eight expected frequencies. Remember, we don't do those for the totals. We use the totals to do these. And now we need eight mini z-scores. So the trick for making that go fast is to take all the O's and put them into one list and all the E's and put them in another. So let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. I have already put them in. So I'm going to stat and edit. And in L1, I put all the O's. I just went across, so I did all of the first row, and then I dropped down to the second one. And then I did, just in the same pattern, I did all the E's. It doesn't actually matter whether you go across or down or diagonal or whatever, but you have to make sure that the O's and E's stay paired up. So 203 needs to be with 104, right? And those are on the same line. So there's all the O's and the E's put in there. So now L3 will be this formula right here. So I want the observed, which are in L1, minus the expecteds, which I put in L2, and the parentheses, and square those, and then divide, whoops, divide by the expecteds, which are in L2. And then I'm getting all eight of my mini Z scores at once. And there they are. Let's write them down. So my chi-squared test statistic is approximately 43.661, oh my. It looks like we're going to reject HO. Remember, these mini z-scores, if they're over 2, that's strong evidence against HO. In our very first square, we got 43.661. So we're going to finish the test, but the evidence is super strong against HO, even after just one square. The next one doesn't seem so big all of a sudden, 3.488. But that is over 2, so that's actually still pretty strong evidence against HO. And then 5.488. Two, four, three. Another pretty big one, 9.113. I'm going to go to a new line because that was the first row on the table. So I want like my mini z scores to match up with the position of the original values. That's helpful in case they ask some follow up questions. All right, so continuing on to that second row. So dropping down to the next number, there's another massive one, 91.494 plus 7.309 plus 10.988 plus 19.097. You can do all these mini z-scores one at a time, but doing the list to do them all at once really is helpful. The sum of all that will be our chi-squared. We have all that data in L3, so the fastest way to get the sum is to move over, go to the list, which is above stat, Go to math, take the sum of L3. So we're about to, in that first entry, that first square, we're going to put the sum of L3, which is our chi-squared test statistic. And these mini z-scores have three decimals. Our total should be having three also, but they only show two there. So if you highlight it, you can see more. So 
three, nine, four. So I suspect that's going to be enough evidence for us to end up rejecting HO, but ultimately it does depend on the p-value. So let's calculate that. Let's come up here and see if we can squeeze in the diagram for our p-value. Chi-squared tests deal with chi-squared distributions, which are right skewed and start at zero. The df is the mean and is usually because of the right skewed nature of the graph, just a little bit to the right of the peak. What is the df on one of these? The df is equal to the number of row categories, 2 minus 1, times the number of column categories, 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1. So we have 2 minus 1 or 1, times 4 minus 1 or 3. So we end up with 1 times 3 or 3 degrees of freedom. So this is 3 right here. So where is 190? This is 0. That's 3. That's 6, there's 9, 12, uh -oh, 190 is way out to C, pardon the pun, um, it's not going to fit, right? So I'm just going to show it over here to the right, 190.394. Uh, tests of independence are always right-tailed, and that, by the way, is because of the squaring we do in the test statistics. So whatever areas to the right of that would be our p-value. It looks really small, but it's actually smaller. If you think about how far 190 really is out there and you think how much area is there, it's essentially going to be nothing. So we should expect a really small area for our p-value, which we will get by doing chi-squared CDF from our test statistic, 190.394 to infinity with 3 degrees of freedom. That will give us our p-value, which I expect to be approximately 0 0.0000. I'm going to boldly write it and then we'll calculate it and see if I was too bold. So second, quit, get a fresh screen here, go to the distribution, drop down to chi-squared CDF. We want to go from 190.394 to infinity. Again, if you don't have infinity stored, just use a big number like 1,000, though that's not so big compared to 190, so you might consider 10,000. The I I have stored is massive, so I have no issues there. And then the degrees of freedom is three. I expect it to be zero. And I got five, uh-oh. But remember, probability can't be bigger than one. So when you see that, go looking for the scientific notation. E negative 41 means move the decimal 41 spots to the left. That five shows up in the 41st decimal place. We're only writing four. They're all zeros, and the place after it is also a zero. So our p-value is essentially zero, meaning that if there was independence between survival and what class ticket you had, there is essentially no chance we would have got a test statistic like this, but we did get a test statistic like this, so it's pretty hard to believe those things are really independent. So hard to believe, in fact, that I'm going to reject HO because I think that was an acceptable risk to take. How big was the risk? Essentially nothing, okay? So really what we're doing is comparing the p-value to alpha. But when your p-value comes out so small, you know that like at any reasonable alpha people would use, you're going to end up rejecting HO. All right, last step, put that into words. It's a little easier to do that when your H1 is already in words. So we were able to reject HO, so there was enough evidence. At the 1% significance level, To show, and what were we trying to show? We were trying to show H1 that the death survive outcome for passengers was dependent on the type of the passenger. All right, so there's our full six steps of the hypothesis test. We do have a follow-up, so we'll look at that as well. Which cell provided the most evidence against independence and explain? So let me just do it with voice first and then we'll write it down. So 
these mini z-scores, if they're close to zero, that is meaning that the observed is close to what we would have expected if HO was true. So when these are small, that's bad evidence for H1. The bigger they get, the stronger the evidence for HO. The biggest two are these two. The biggest one is that 9194. Because I chose to write out my mini z-scores in a pattern that followed the table, it's easier to figure out what square that was in the table. Second row, first column, which is this one. So what evidence provided the strongest evidence against independence? The fact that we would have expected 100, about 105 first class passengers to have survived if there was independence, but we had way more than that at 203. And the mini z score is saying kind of there's no way a difference that big is just due to random variation. All right, so which cell was it? It was the number of first class passengers that survived. So it was the C1 D2 cell, which was the first class and survived category. And then why is it that one? Because it had the largest contribution to the test statistic. To the chi-squared test statistic. Wait a minute, that's not what I said before I started writing, right? I said it was the one with the largest mini z-score. Well, here's our chi-squared test statistic. How do we get that? By adding up all the mini z-scores. So another phrase for them, or the official phrase for these pieces is the contributions to the test statistic, but they're what we call the mini z-scores. So we're talking about the same thing there. All right, just a quick follow-up. So we're basically deciding at the end that whether you survived or died was not independent of what kind of ticket you bought. And if you look at what happened in these cells where we got the most evidence against independence, which was the first class passengers, we had a lot less dying than we would have expected, a lot more surviving. So when you first see that, you could decide that there was some favoritism towards first class passengers, that maybe they got first dibs on lifeboats or something. And I wasn't there, I don't know what happened. I've seen the movie, but I don't remember. Um, but I can tell you this with some confidence. I believe that first class tickets are higher up in the ship uh, because basically those people want a view, right? So you want to get up above that water line and have a window, maybe even a balcony where you can look at. And it, in the case of a sinking ship, those lower decks start filling with water and some of those people are going to drown before they ever get a chance to even get up to where the lifeboats are. So... Was there favoritism shown? I don't know, but you would kind of expect people in the top decks to have a better chance to survive because they're closer to the lifeboats, and that is, in fact, where those first-class tickets tend to be. All right, on to the next one. All right, on to the next one. Several sections of an introductory algebra class are being taught with the aid of computerized instruction. Students are given a quiz at the end of each chapter that they are required to pass. If they fail the first attempt, then they must attempt a computer-generated practice quiz online again and again until they pass it. Once they have passed the practice quiz, they are then allowed to retake the real quiz, a similar version to the first one. A random sample of 25 students that failed a quiz but eventually retook it was obtained. Let scores on a first failed attempt be population 1 and the scores on a subsequent retake after passing a practice quiz be population 2 the sample produced the following statistics. So we see that n was 25, the average distance or difference um, between before and after was negative 18.12, and the standard deviation of those differences was 11.322. We don't actually get to see the before and after scores. It's already been summarized for us, so we're just gonna work with those. So let's look at the question. Does the data provide enough evidence at the 1% significance level to show that students on average will do better after having passed the practice quiz. So it sounds like a hypothesis test. It sounds like a hypothesis test about a mean. So I expect my H0 and my H1 to have mu or mu's in them. 
because this is a before and after comparison where we've got D bars and differences around, this seems like the section 11.1 paired t-test. So in a test like that, HL would be mu1 equals mu2, where if we look at what they said here, um, the first failed attempt is population one, and then population two is the retake. So HO would say the average score on the first attempt is the same as what their retake score is, but that's not what we're trying to show. We're trying to show H1 that says students will do better after they've passed the practice quiz when they go on to their retake. So their retake will be better after they have passed that practice quiz. Better than what? Better than their first attempt. And mu1 represents first attempt. Mu2 represents the retake after all the practicing has happened. And what are they saying? We'll do better on the retake after we've passed that practice quiz. So we're saying this one will be better. In terms of a test score, better means higher. So we're saying this one after will be better than it was before. So it can be a little confusing to see a phrase like do better and then write a less than symbol, but this is both symbols in a way. We're saying mu1 is less than mu2, but that means we're also saying mu2 is greater than mu1. And the greater matches this, and it just all depends on your point of view. But we're talking about how they would do on their retake, that's here, compared to their first attempt. So a little tricky on these. You've got to really think about the point of view and make sure that this truly matches the words, not just do it quick based on, oh, better, it must be a greater. Uh, yeah, greater, but greater for which one? So you've got to think it through on these paired t-tests. All right, let's move along. Step two, decide on a significance level. We are given a 1% significance level, so alpha is equal to 0.01. So there's our setup phase. Now we want to compute a test statistic and a p-value and then make our decision. So I think it's wise on these to write the formula down. So the test statistic for one of these is d bar divided by the standard deviation for the differences divided by the square root of the sample size. So plugging in the information they gave us up above, we have negative 1812 divided by 11.322, which is itself divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 25. All right, so one of the things that you need to remember when you're doing test statistics, if you have more than one number in the numerator or denominator, you need parentheses around that. So you don't have to write them, but you do have to type them into the calculator. So let's see if that difference is a big deal. We have negative 18.12 divided by 11.322, which is itself divided by the square root of 25, which is, of course, 5. But a lot of times you'll have messy numbers there that don't have perfect uh, that aren't perfect squares that you don't know the roots of. So this is what it would look like in general to compute that test statistic. Oh my, negative 8.002. That is a really big test statistic. Remember, if HO was true, you would expect to get a difference that was within a couple standard deviations of the mean. We're over eight standard deviations away from the mean. And we're to the left because it's negative. And if you look at the symbol here, we're doing a left-tailed test. So it looks like this hypothesis test is going to end with us rejecting HO. But let's verify that with a p-value. So we're doing the t-distribution. So we do a bell-shaped curve. DF is a factor. On this type, the DF is 1 less than the sample size. The sample size is 25. So our DF is 24. With T curves, we have zero in the middle. And these curves are a little wider than normal curves. Normally, for a Z curve, we'd expect them to flatten out around negative three and three. And these are a little wider, but not this much wider. So negative 8.002 is still way out there. So it's kind of like over here. I'll put it right here on the edge. So negative 8.002 is our test statistic. And then it is a left-tailed test, not because we landed on the left, but because we had the less than symbol. So the area we're trying to find would be any area over here past that 8 .0, negative 8.002 and on the left. So that right there is our p-value. 
It would also be TCDF from negative infinity to negative 8.002 with 24 degrees of freedom. That would be that little area right there. It would also be our p-value. And I expect that to be really small. Let's put it in the calculator and see what we get. So we go to the distribution menu. So a second distribution, we want TCDF. The left boundary on that is there's not one. So forever to the left, so negative alpha infinity. The right-hand boundary is negative 8.002, and whoops, another comma. We're doing that with 24 degrees of freedom. I'm expecting a small answer, so getting the scientific notation is no surprise. Move that decimal to the left eight spots, and our eighth decimal spot would be a one. So if we write out our first four decimal spots, they would all be zeros. The spot after that would also be a zero, so if we rounded it to four places, this is what we'd get. We don't get a non-zero digit until the eighth spot, and we just don't usually write that many on our p-value. All right, so there's our p-value. It's a bit essentially zero, definitely less than alpha. So we're going to come to the conclusion that we should reject HO because there's an acceptably low risk of making a type 1 error, essentially almost no risk. So again, thinking about what the p-value says, if there was really no difference in the average scores between your first attempt and your retake after all the practice, then it would be almost impossible that we would have seen a difference in our sample that big. So in order to believe that we got that test statistic and HO is true, we have to believe that we got almost impossibly lucky. So this really is what we got for our differences. So either that was a miracle or HO is false. So we're going to go ahead and reject HO. It's very unlikely that it's true. Let's state our conclusion in words. We were able to reject. So there is enough evidence at the 1% significance level to show, what were we trying to show? H1. And what was that? To show that students on average will do better after having passed the practice quiz. Hopefully I'll give you better spacing on the final. Sorry about that. I'm going to squeeze in those last few words. Um, so I kind of used the wording of the question. You could also just kind of translate it. Probably best to take it from the mu2 point of view. So there is enough evidence at the 1% significance level to show that the true mean score on your retake after having passed a practice quiz is greater than the true average for original attempts. That's a little wordier. So I went with this option and it barely fit in. But um, you can go with the wording here, but ultimately we're trying to say we proved H1, so you want to make sure it matches that wording. All right, on to the next question. Now they want us to compute a 98% confidence interval for the difference in average score for all students on the first and second attempt of that chapter quiz. So it's a confidence interval for the difference. So the formula for that should be D bar plus or minus a T star based on our confidence level times the standard deviation of the differences divided by the square root of the sample size. So we need to fill in all those pieces and see what we get. D bar, S, and N are already provided, so we really just need the T star. That comes from the confidence level. Be careful, that does not come from your hypothesis test. That had nothing to do with the 98% confidence level. We need to use that here, so we draw in that 98%. In the middle, that means there's 2% uh, left over, so that means 1% on each side. We're looking for the T star. We want to remember that we have a DF on this that was equal to 24. So the area in the tail is 0 0.01. We have 24 degrees of freedom. So if we get our formula sheet out, 
and we drop down in the 0.01 column and so there's that 0.01 right until we get to 24 degrees of freedom the intersection of those two is right there 2.492 so that is our T star and now we have all the pieces we need here so D bar was negative 18.12 plus or minus that T star we just found times S 11.322, remember that was given at the top of this page, divided by the square root of our sample size, which is 25. We usually want to see our margin of error, so, all right, negative 18.12 plus or minus, and then compute this margin of error piece. So let's see what we get there. So it is 2.492 times 11.322 divided by the square root of our sample size, which is 25. Again, we should know the square root of 25 is five. You could just divide by that, but if we have a square root of 27, we're not gonna know that one. This is what it would look like. Remember, for confidence intervals, if your point estimate has two decimal places, then that's what you want on your margin of error. We're gonna match those. So this would also have two decimal places, so plus or minus the 5.64. So, what's our confidence interval? It's for the difference in means before and after in the population. And we can subtract and add to see what those ranges are. So, negative 18.12 minus 5.64. 5.64 gives us the left side. Negative 23.76. If we do an addition, we get the right side, negative 12.48. All right, so there's our confidence interval. Explain how that interval agrees with the decision we reached in part A. Well, let me do it in words and then I'll do it in symbols. So we're saying here that the true difference in means before on our, on our first attempt versus uh, our retake, that the difference between those is somewhere between negative 23 and negative 12. But anywhere in that range, it is negative. So what does it mean? For the difference to be negative. It means that the second number must have been bigger than the first one. If you think back to like fourth grade or wherever it is we first saw negative numbers, they happen when the, we do a subtraction and the second number is bigger. So we're confident that the difference is negative, so we're confident that mu2 is bigger than mu1. Well, that means we're confident that h1 is true and that we should reject ho. So now let me write that out in symbols. So if mu1 minus mu2 is an element of that interval we just calculated, and we are 98% confident that it is, then what does that mean? Well, the entire range is negative, so that implies that that difference is negative. We write that something is negative mathematically by saying it's less than zero, and that means that HO, which claimed they were equal to each other, is false. And also important, H1 is true. Uh, I think I kind of skipped a line here. If the difference is less than zero, that means mu1 is less than mu2. So if mu1 is less than mu2, they're not equal. But this one is true. And so what should you do if HO is false and you're confident of that? You should reject HO. Is that what we did? Yes. So the two do agree with each other. All right. All right, on to the last question. A stock analyst wondered whether the mean rate of return of financial energy and utility stocks differed over the past five years. He obtained a simple random sample of eight companies from each of the three sectors and obtained the five-year rates of return in percent shown in the table below. Dot plots with the sample mean marked are shown together with stack crunch output from the ANOVA hypothesis test. So just talking about the information they've given us, it says these are percentages. So here is a financial stock that had a 10.76% uh, rate of return over the five-year period. Down here is a utility stock that had a 7.11% rate of return over the five-year period. So that's what this information represents. Here's a graph of those pieces of data separated into the different types. The vertical line represents the sample mean for each group, and then this table over here 
has our ANOVA output. So let's use that information to answer the questions. So jumping into the first one, discuss the requirement that the populations for each group should have equal standard deviations. So we just do, we treat that as a loose requirement and we just have a rule of thumb that we check to see if that's reasonable or not. And what we do for that is we take the standard deviation of the largest or the largest standard deviation, we divide that by the smallest standard deviation. And as long as that's less than two, we consider it to be reasonable that the requirement has been met. So our sample standard deviations are right here in the table. The largest one is about, is that five? So 5.1238. 5 we usually put five decimal places on standard deviations, or five, sorry, significant figures, so that's what I did. Seven was followed by a five, so I rounded that up. In the denominator, we want the smallest standard deviation. These are kind of close, but the 4.531 is the smallest. If I did five significant figures, that would be 5304. So pretty obvious, I think, that the bottom one is not, uh, or the top one's not more than double the, the bottom one. So that's going to be less than two, but no harm in actually doing the division to verify that. But I think it's fairly easy to see on this one. And I think we should always be thinking about these things with our brain, not just with the calculator. So should be less than two, and it is. If this is ever less than one, you did it wrong. So uh, you're supposed to do largest divided by smallest. So if the numerator is bigger than the denominator, you should always get an answer bigger than one. As long as it's smaller than two, sorry, this is approximately 1.13, which is smaller than two. As long as that happens, it's a reasonable thing to believe that the populations have equal standard deviations. This doesn't prove that, but it makes it a reasonable thing. So it's reasonable to think that the requirements have been met. So what we usually say there is this requirement can be considered met. Do we know that we have equal population standard deviations? No, but we passed this kind of simple rule of thumb test, so it is reasonable to think that that could be the case, that we have equal population standard deviations. We certainly don't have equal sample standard deviations. You can see that here, but they're close enough to each other that it's reasonable to believe that in the population they might be equal. So we'll go ahead and continue on with the test. All right, let's move on to the next part discuss the requirement that the sample for each group should be large or drawn from the normal populations. When we talk about the large sample, it's important to understand we're not talking about the total of all that information up at the top. We're talking about the size of each group, and the sample size for each group is right here in the chart. They were each of a sample size of eight, so that's not near the 30 we need to consider them to be large. So what we need is that they should be drawn from normal populations. That's a little bit messy to check. So again, we go with a looser rule of thumb, which is we're gonna consider that requirement to be met as long as none of the dot plots show signs of a severe skewing. And kind of uniformly spread out for utilities, somewhat uniformly spread out for energy, somewhat uniformly spread out for financial. What we don't have is a stack on one side with outliers on the other. So we do not have signs of severely skewed. So we're gonna key off of that. So none of the dot plots seem severely skewed. So what does that mean? Well, those are just samples, right? So that doesn't prove anything about the population, but it makes it reasonable to consider this requirement has been met. So, it is reasonable to consider this requirement met. All right, so now on to the actual hypothesis test. Perform an ANOVA test at the 5% significance level to determine whether or not the true mean five-year rate of return is the same for the financial energy and utility sectors 
show all six steps, but get the values for the test statistic and the p-value from the technology output above. All right, so that already told us it's in the NOVA test. It's kind of boring. We don't have to figure it out for ourselves. But ANOVA tests are about mu. So we see true mean there. That's a signal. But we do it uh, with three or more means. And we have three categories here. So that's kind of how we can tell that this fits into that model. So for HO, we could say mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3, but then we better say which one is 1, 2, and 3. So another way to do it would be to say that mu of financial, so mu f, equals the mu of energy, mu e, equals the mu of utility, so mu u. So 1, 2, 3, f, e, u, either way is okay. Then H1 is going to be in words. We're going to say at least one mean differs from another. And let's be more clear, at least one population mean differs from another. Step two, kind of always an easy one, just to note the significance level. They said 5% significance level, so 0.05. Step three, normally a pretty hard step, a time, or at least a time-consuming step to do your test statistic, but this is an F stat, and the table right here tells us what the F stat is, so we just have to copy that down. And while we're pointing that out, we can go ahead and note right there is the p-value too. So we'll just copy those down. Test statistics we usually put three decimal places on, so f is approximately 2.077. And we don't have a lot of knowledge on how the f st statistic works because we haven't computed that ourselves by hand, so we don't even know, like, is that a big value, small value, is it strong evidence, is it weak evidence? But the p-value will kind of answer that for us. So what was our p-value? 0.1502. And that tells me that that is kind of weak evidence because the p-value is telling me that if HO is true, there'd be about a 15% chance that you could get a test statistic that was that far away from what you'd expect to get if they were true. And so a 15% chance is a pretty high chance that something like this could happen if HO is true. So is it reasonable to continue to believe HO is true when you see a, a t test statistic like this? Yes, because the chance of seeing one like that if HO is true is higher than alpha. So we haven't had one of these yet, but on this one we're going to end up saying do not reject HO. And why not? Because it would be too risky to reject HO this time because our p-value is greater than alpha. There is a reasonably high chance of getting a test statistic like this just due to random variation from a population where the means are all equal. And then finally, stating our conclusion in words, we didn't have enough evidence to reject this time, thus the do not reject. So there is not enough evidence. At the, what were we working at? The 5% significance level. To show what? To show there wasn't enough evidence to show that at least one population mean differs from another. All right, that wraps up this problem. That also wraps up this worksheet, so good luck as you continue studying for the final, and I hope you do your best.